Tere päeva, mina olen Kati Kolma, mina olen tänase Kusupoori Koogiu. Nüüd on meile jõudnud siia kõigi huvilist, et Charles Ross, kelle teisi keeles on hakanud ilmuma raamatusari Lüst kaupmähed ja kuidas seda võelda, et on meie fantaasia kirjanduse lugeja ja spesialist Mark Robert intervjueerid seda. Ja igalt siin üks ma ütlen praegu kohe ära, et me ma pärast unustame olla, et pärast kohtu, mis autogramme saab võtta teise korru seal, nüüd väiksime selle korru seal vahel, et siis võib kogu nende sinna. Pead võistud teile. Kas te kuulete mind? Jah. Is everybody in? We we started uh, this exchange of ideas a few days ago, and uh, last Thursday, I mean this Thursday, uh, we we talked about uh, really a lot of things, yeah. and and uh, you thought it would be prudent to uh, touch upon some of the subjects today as well, just to get us going. Uh, we talked about Moore's Law and Cooley's Law. Not really London or limit yet, but uh, you, you mentioned a rather recent development which uh, could be interpreted as the breaking of Moore's Law. What is the current number of atoms needed to create a bit of data and how can it be further diminished? Well, perhaps we should put this in context with um, a bit of preamble about my fiction. I'm a science fiction writer, which means, to my way of thought, um, I like to explore aspects of the human condition that may be affected by new technologies. Um, you could argue that it's almost impossible to write a modern mainstream novel set in the modern period that doesn't have killer robot drones over Afghanistan and people walking around with glowing glass slabs with some total of human knowledge on the tap clutching their hands. This would have, both of these things would have been frankly science fiction 20 years ago, but they're now part of the modern world. Um, as somebody who, I guess, I've worked in the technology industry, um, one of my strands of fiction related to not near future science fiction works. Um, actually, if you think about it, mainstream models that take into account the development of new technologies and ask how they would affect society and our interpersonal relations. And one of the key problems we face over the next hundred years is how we are going to deal with far too much information. To put this in perspective, um, can I ask for a brief show of hands? Who here in the audience does not have internet access? Ooh, one person. Right. Everybody in this audience except one person is on the internet. Um, and most of what you do on the internet is tracked, it is aggregated, it is what they're calling this year big data. Um, where is it all going? Where is it being stored? Um, People, pundits in general, talk globally about the cloud. What we mean by the cloud is gigantic factory-sized warehouses full of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of computers and their associated hard disks, all designed to store just about everything that's out there. Um, to put in perspective from another angle, 10% uh, of all photographs ever taken by humanity have been taken in the past 12 months. This figure is actually accelerating, and 30% of those photographs go on Facebook within 48 hours. Um, you Facebook has the yeah, photographic singularity. Yeah, gradually, everything we do, everything we see, everything we say is being recorded photographically and indexed. When you throw enough computing power at it, we have software that can usually recognize faces. It can tag where you've been, the GPS coordinates at which photographs were taken usually the cameras, uh, it can tag when and when you were there, it can also identify who you were with. Um, so how much data can we realistically store? Currently, we're heading towards a limit imposed by physics of roughly one bit per atom. Um, you can actually store more than one bit per atom with data compression, but that 
may result in us losing access to the data or in questionable uh, accuracy in restoring it. Um, but the implication of this is quite staggering. There is pretty much no limit to the amount of data we can aggregate and store. What does it mean to the future of the human race if everything we do is recorded and can, in principle, be left? Will we be able to run away from our youthful stupidity? Will we be allowed to change our minds? What sort of person becomes a politician where everything they have ever done in public is visible? And when I say in public, I mean in front of other people, in the presence of another human being. Um, there are going to be some interesting consequences for that. Um, how serious did they take the world of uh, rapture of the nerves? COVID and good COVID on through? Well, that was a rather silly exercise in extrapolation beyond the bounds of what, where we can easily go. There is a intellectual football in science fiction that's been a hot new topic for the past 20 years called the singularity. On the one hand, it's an attempt at examining the consequences of the universe if we ever succeed in creating a transhuman artificial intelligence, something that is as faster and smarter than we are, as we are compared to a pet hamster, um, at which point we're no longer going to be shaping the world we live in. We're going to be, hopefully, pets at worst prey in somebody else's world. Um, the other aspect of the singularity, though, is it's got cross fertilized with a lot of strange eschatological ideas about resurrecting people from their past, from records of their past activities. You know, if you've got a photographic record and a speech record of everything somebody did during their life, can you back, can you extrapolate from that to their brain? Can you then uh, physically resurrect them at some future point? Um, the rapture of an was an attempt to get inside the head of where this is all coming from and examine the, under, the ideological underpinnings of transhumanism. Um, and it featured a lot of very embarrassing social scenes in post-human bathrooms because... But to... Werner um, Winger's Ray Kurzweil's technological... Yeah. Singularity is, is not really something you consider a viable future option. Um, I'm agnostic on it. The idea that uh, we're going to have artificial intelligence is begs the question of what human consciousness and intelligence is. Trying to examine the consequences should such an intelligence appear on the scene that we have to coexist with is fascinating in the dream of science fiction. But whether we're actually going to get there is another question entirely. Whether it's possible to get there for that matter, um, it's a subject of serious debate among computer scientists. Um, for those who argue for it, and those who argue very strongly against it. Um, other aspects of the post-humanist agenda <coughs> include intelligence amplification, making ourselves brighter, for example, by brain implants, or external memory prosthesis and devices like Google Glass. Um, medical technology improvements to make us immortal. I think this is to some extent wishful thinking, but certainly we're better at curing many medical diseases than we were 40 years ago. Um, Brain uploads is... Yeah, is, that's uh, a difficult one. Um, the idea that you can connect a human brain up to a network of very fast computers, map the connections, and then run the human mind as a piece of software in silicon, that's difficult. That's a reach. We're not going to get How there. How do we do it to destroy the connections? Yeah, but again, there's a thought experiment pioneered by Professor Hans Moravec, Carnegie Mellon University, a decade or so, suggesting that you might do it piece by piece, basically by mapping individual neurons on the surface of the brain, simulating them, connecting by microelectrodes to the adjacent neurons, then removing the original one and repeating until you've not a live mind that has been transferred from the meat machine to the silicon machine, as it were, without ever stopping. It will be destroyed in the process, but it will be imported to new hardware. This may sound crazy, but this actually happens every second inside computing clusters, where software is migrated from one microprocessor to another within the same multiprocessor machine, without ever stopping or losing track of the um, I am skeptical. Um, however, I can't prove its impossibility. 
And so, you know, as meat and drink for a speculative fiction writer who wants to look at the consequences of new technologies and how they will affect us, well, it's a legitimate target. Um, speaking of technology and government intervention, we, um, a, a subject that we briefly discussed is that was the dismal state of uh, war on some drugs globally and especially here in Estonia. We had the highest overdose mortality in Europe. Uh, our Minister of the Interior is convinced that the first thing that needs to be done to remedy this is to hunt down and cage more street dealers. Do you think he should gain a better perspective on the problem if he read Christian Princes? Uh, I'd hope so. Um, certainly that's exactly the wrong end to tackle the problem of street drugs from. The problem is actually one of people self-medicating, um, often to get high of pleasure, but very often because they're in existential pain or there is something else wrong with their life. And criminalizing these people isn't productive. What we need to do is to find ways of helping users. And decriminalization seems like an important step to me, simply because the economic impact of organized crime. Um, which you heavily discussed in the <coughs> for instance. Yeah. That was, a, that was a series of novels which, in addition to examining American real politics and planting a bomb under the seat of a, lot, a particular type of fantasy novel was always irritated me immensely. Um, was also looking a bit at the economics of the drug trade. Um, again, from a 90 degree angle to reality, because the excess of a multiverse where there are multiple parallel worlds of different levels of economic development. Um, in this case, I had a surprise. If you can travel to and from a parallel world, what do you do? And the first and most obvious thing is arbitrage. Uh, move goods which are of given value in one place to somewhere else where they're more valuable. And one of the most useful things you can do, if you're looking for that, is a low weight, high value commodity like heroin. Um, but uh, it has been argued that a lot of pressure for the war on drugs to continue comes from the prison industry, which in America is largely privatized and quite possibly from the high-end drug cartels themselves who are not above bribing politicians to maintain a tough on drugs stance because it drives up the street price. Scarcity actually makes it more profitable for organized crime. Speaking of um, politicians um, and uh, merchant princes, uh, recently a Twitter flame war between our president and the Nobel winning economist Paul Krugman, who has uh, lauded the Merchant Princess series for its astute economic perspective, uh, was made into an opera called Nostra Culpa. Do you think the rift between the Keynesian economic model and the austerity policies is a serious long term global issue, something worth immortalizing in choral music? I don't know if it's a serious, if it's long term in that. Um, but it's definitely symptomatic of a malaise of the times. Below, well, I can't help thinking that over the past 200 years or so, while capitalism has brought us immense wealth, um, I read recently that it suggested that something like 99.3% of all economic value ever created has been created in the past 200 years. That's nothing to sneeze at. Um, it's also led us into some very strange places, and there is some sort of failure mode to which our current economic theories and our systems of governance are prone. Um, sometimes it feels to me as if the planet we live on has been invaded by Martians. Um, we're sort of living under their boot heel, trying as we can to make ends meet, trying to do our best for ourselves. Some of us work for the Martians, but they are far more powerful than we are. And any sort of rebellion we make is crushed fairly rapidly by their proxies. And the Martian invaders in question are public corporations, publicly owned corporations. They, do, they are alien in the sense that they are hive intelligences that do not have individual human motivations. Rather, they're governed by corporate law that requires them to maximize their return on investment for the most part and to show a quarterly profit. Seeds of the, uh, the, the white offspring. Yeah, their, their motivations are not the same as human motivations. 
their activities emerge from a hive of interchangeable human components who, if they do not cooperate, will be sacked. And um, these entities have come to dominate our world. And the strangest thing of all about them is their short-termism. Um, the average corporation, have, the average top 100 corporation in America has a lifespan of only 30 years. Um, yes, we can all think of corporations that are much older than that. We can all think of them ones that go back hundreds of years, in some cases even a thousand years. But these are the minorities, these are the ones that we remember. For the most part, they are ephemeral. They come together, they are taken over and swallowed up by each other, they go bankrupt eventually. And <clears throat> they have come to utterly dominate our political and economic life. So yeah, we've been invented by Martians, and the Martians are us. Where we go from here, how we deal with this is another matter entirely. But the conflict between Keynesian economic stimulus proposals and neoliberalism is essentially a conflict between two views of how of who the world is to be run on behalf of. Whether, he, whether individual interests are prime or the interests of corporations. Estonia has been called the poster child for cyber security. Six, six years ago, we became the first country to be targeted by what appeared to be a large scale coordinated international cyber attack. And now McAfee's report says we're one of the top countries best prepared for cyber attacks. But can one really be prepared in this time to the playing field? Is changing so rapidly? Should we perhaps start working on technologies to capture and contain hostile AIs? instead of DDoS effects? Well, luckily we haven't come up with any actual hostile AIs yet unless you count Google's advertising system. <laughs> <laughs> We're being targeted, I feel we're being targeted. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to say very strongly at this point that speaking to somebody who's been on the internet for more than 20 years, has a computer science degree and has worked in the field, whenever I hear somebody use the word cyber as a prefix, I immediately um, assume the next word coming out of their mouth is synonymous with bullshit. Um, now, a large part of our security problems are a result of two things. Very bad design decisions early in the game when we were developing computers. Um, for example, the American National Security Agency in the mid-1980s vetoed the then internet, DARPANET, which was developing the protocols that the internet runs on, from having any end-to-end -end encryption built in. Because they thought it would make life harder for them. So the result is a lot of traffic on the internet today is unencrypted, making it vulnerable to hacking. That's just one example. The other problem we've got is our cognitive biases make us very vulnerable to certain types of fraud. And there are people on the internet who want to make money off us via the easiest mechanism. Um, I mean, who here hasn't had at least one pleading email from a nun running a orphanage in Nigeria who's dying of cancer and really needs some help getting uh, relocating some bank funds from the West into the West? And you know, would you mind lending us your bank account for a few days so we can do this and save the orphans? Um, total fraud, but people fall for this sort of thing. Um, the internet is simply a medium that allows better, better and faster communication. Um, this means it allows ordinary people to come in and to, to, it provides better access to ordinary people for criminals and fraudsters. Um, attacks on the infrastructure are another matter entirely. Um, again, some of these are organized gangs of criminals. Um, crime on the internet has become a really major problem. Again, partly because it wasn't designed for security in mind. Um, I guess the real problem is we've got the equivalent of a culture where everybody trusts everybody else um, and nobody has invented the lock to go in the front of the door. Or rather, locks are out there, but only expert locksmiths know how to use them. You can imagine that such a society would be vulnerable to the first burden who came along, and that's pretty much what we've got. Let's set, up, set our sights a, a bit higher. Private businesses have started climbing out of the gravity well. SpaceX is successfully resupplying the International Space Station a 
couple of consortiums have set aside some asteroid mining, at least announced plans to do so. Uh, space still appears to be a new frontier. But you've made it quite clear in your work that unless something like the Eskaton uh, in the singularity of Sky Islands and that is uh, universe occurs, canned monkeys will probably not make it off world. Do you still believe that? Uh, to some extent, yes. I mean, this might surprise many of you in the audience, but speaking as a science fiction writer, I'm very skeptical about space travel. Um, part of this is because, well, fairly obviously, we are human beings, we are mammals. We have co evolved to live on one particular planet in, well, we're very flexible. We can live in a range of different biomes on this planet. But we're basically planet bound, we evolved at one place at one time. And to put it in perspective, um, if you take a human being naked and drop them at random on the Earth today, 90% of the time they will be dead within 15 minutes if you drop them to a random location. That's because 80% of the surface of this planet is ocean, and of the remaining land area, roughly 50% is utterly uninhabitable. Antarctica, for example, the Antarctic ice cap, or a cliff, or a mountainside, or the caldera of a volcano. So, as it is, we are only really suited to survive on approximately 10% of the surface of the Earth today, which is the period for which we evolved. But it gets worse. The Earth is approximately 4,500 million years old. However, the Earth has been uninhabitable by human-like life for about for the first four billion of those years. Um, prior to the Cambrian explosion around, of new life forms around 600 million years ago, there wasn't really enough oxygen in the atmosphere or the ocean to support vertebrate life. Um, Land-dwelling life like us only goes back about 250 million years. Indeed, for the first Three and a half billion years, there was not enough oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere to support life on land. Um, that's because it took billions of years of single celled organisms photosynthesizing to eventually produce enough free oxygen to oxidize all the iron based rocks on the surface and then <coughs> to begin pumping oxygen into the atmosphere. So if you look at human life, we're only suited to life on 10% of the planet today. And we're only suited to life for maybe 10% of the planet's lifetime. So the Earth alone is only 1% inhabited by human beings, summed over its entire history. Uh, the rest of the solar system is even worse. Um, Elon Musk has said he wants to retire on Mars. Well, firstly, he's going to have to run the gauntlet of extremely heavy radiation environment to get there. Um, think in terms of spreading your sleeping bag on the roof of a nuclear reactor. Um, levels of radiation. Then when he gets there, um, this is a planet where the atmosphere at the surface is about one thirtieth as dense as the atmosphere at the top of Mount Everest and has no oxygen. Um, we can conceivably, as Bruce Sterling pointed out, spend a thousand years and the equivalent of hundreds of trillions of dollars terraforming Mars, adapting it with vegetation, warming it with mirrors, pumping oxygen into the atmosphere, but at the end of the day, at the end of a thousand years of work, we'll be left with somewhere that is less habitable than the Gobi Desert. Um, there is no obvious economic motive for colonizing Mars, and if you want to colonize somewhere, why not, why not start with the Gobi Desert? At least if things go wrong, you can walk home from there. Do you agree with, with uh, Geoff Ryman's notion that Regular science, science fiction is based on an adolescent desire to run away from our world. And is mundane science fiction somehow better or more, uh, more of a challenge than regular science fiction? Ah, oh, now, here we're changing the topic onto you, as if you didn't see that coming. We're talking about the material of science fiction. Um, Jeff Ryman is a British science fiction writer, or more accurately, a Canadian science fiction writer living in the UK. Um, <coughs> And yeah, he does tend to bang the drum periodically about so much of current day science fiction being basically a literature of escapism. And he's absolutely right. 
Not that there is anything wrong with escapism, and escapism is indeed very, very popular as the continued success of, for example, Dan Brown indicates. But uh, some of us start to wince a little bit and get embarrassed at pure escapism and like to actually think of our fiction as doing something more serious or examining aspects of the human condition or probing interesting ideas. Now, one of the points Jeff makes, um, along with a class of literature students of his, is that science fiction has come to rely on a set of stock tropes, many of which are actually relatively implausible. Um, if you take Star Trek, Star Wars, and Doctor Who, you've pretty much run the gamut of the stock sort of wardrobe. You have faster than light starships that can travel between star systems in a matter of days or weeks. Um, you have time machines. You have aliens, be they human actors in latex makeup or things with far too many tentacles. You have artificial intelligence. We have phasers and death rays and all sorts of gadgets. Now, these are very useful props if what you're doing is trying to tell stories, or in many cases, archetypes or myths in a new register. But they are somewhat less plausible when you try and examine them. Um, we cannot prove that faster than light travel is impossible. There are indeed some hypotheses that suggest ways of doing it, but nothing remotely on the cards for doing it. Ditto time travel. We have seen no actual evidence of extraterrestrial life, and even if there is any out there, it's almost impossibly distant. Well, so, so what are these to, what are these things used for in science fiction? Well, you could argue that a faster than light starship is semiotically equivalent to a fire breathing dragon. Um, your magic wand that fires bolts of lightning is equivalent to a handheld laser pistol. Aliens are orcs. I mean, this is basically the trappings of fantasy. And Japanese students came up with their some things sounds like as a way of counteracting that. And it's quite simple. Don't use cheap, off-the-shelf, cliched ideas in science fiction. Try and do something serious. Try and think everything through for yourself. If you want to write a mundane science fiction story that involves faster than light starships, then fine. But make sure that you're ex examining the story from the ground up, and that that is, if anything, the main subject, or rather the main regret on which your examination of the human condition changes. Um, and I, for one, found this a very original idea, and I seem to have accidentally become one of the leading exponents of mundane science fiction, having written several novels. Something with a whole thing state. Though. Yeah. Halting State was a novel I wrote in 2005-2006, published in 2007. It's a, crime, a police procedural novel, a crime novel set in Edinburgh, in Scotland in the year 2017, <clears throat> most of which has an unfortunately already come true. This is a bit disconcerting. Um, it opens when a police officer walks into the offices of a computer games company who have phoned the police because there's been a bank robbery. Um, and she's taking down the details of the alleged robbery and is getting more and more puzzled as they show this video footage on the screen of a bunch of orcs robbing a bank in the vault of a castle where many of the depositors are wizards and you know, they brought along a dragon for fire support. And she's about to arrest them all for wasting police time and somebody points out but what has actually been stolen is deposits, which in real world money, because it's a massively multiplayer online game, are the equivalent of several million pounds. Um, something like this has actually happened. I mean, I got the original inspiration of this when I was hearing in 2004 an incident that occurred for real in London. Um, a man walks into a police station um, goes up to the desk sergeant. Hi, I want to request. I want to report a crime. Uh, okay. What sort of crime? Well, this guy on eBay sold me a magic sword, and it's not magic. <laughs> <laughs> Would you back up a moment, sir? Have you been taking any drugs? After about half an hour's explanation, the police officer finally realised that yes, a crime had actually been committed. The complainant had was a player of a massively multiplayer online game. And 
magical items within the game, the fantasy game, are traded on various websites, and you actually pay real money to buy them. <coughs> um, if anyone here is familiar with the history of World of Warcraft, gold farming, then you can skip this bit. What had happened was, our, our, our complainant was a player in this game, he had bought a magic item, an enchanted sword, on a website uh, as an in-game item, and it was not as described, it was just an unenchanted sword, and he paid real money for this. The actual crime was fraud, you know, selling something under false pretenses that is not what is reported to be as less value. But at this point it became obvious that you know there's something interesting happening in these virtual worlds. Games like World of Warcraft are actually the first commercially viable self-supporting form of virtual reality. Yeah, yeah, but sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah sorry. Well, it gets strange. It gets stranger and stranger. There was an interesting paper published by some academic economists around 2002, pointing out that the game Ultimate Online was about the first to allow, if I remember correctly, to allow in-game items to be traded for real money in the real world, and they worked out on the basis of the value of items in that game that were traded, and the size of the actual online game. But the game had an economy that, if it was fully interchangeable with real world currencies, would be about the same size as Austria. That was 10 years ago. So we're definitely going into some interesting alleyways. Baltic State was my attempt to explore the implications of the economics of online role-playing games and virtual reality 10 years in the future, when it has become a fertile territory for serious organized criminals. Um, a little over a year ago, uh, some British science fiction authors, Geoff uh, Ryman among them, uh, Alistair Maynard, Ken McLeod, Justin Robson, and others, called to put the science, fi science in science fiction to establish a new governmental body in UK in order to facilitate the exchange of ideas between scientists and writers and help make science in fiction more credible. Do you think this was a good idea? And how much do you personally cooperate with research science? Well, it's a good idea in principle, and um, occasionally I go and bug some research scientists to do my homework for me, to kick the tires of a story I'm working on. And um, I try and read widely and keep abreast of what people are talking about and what new developments are coming out. Um, whether this is going to have any effect on government policy is anybody's guess. My guess would be no. Um, there is a lamentable tendency for politicians to come up with policies first and then look for evidence to support them rather than the other way around. And I think that's true everywhere. Um, it would be nice to think that science fiction actually had some social or political significance. Sometimes, occasionally, it does. I was slightly alarmed after Halting State came out to get an invitation to Pentagon think tank. Um, I went along and did my research for a techno frigorish novel, the Merchant Princess series, in which the White House is new. Um, but yeah, uh, most of the time we were ignored. You refused to do um, No, I went along. Oh, how's that working out? I wanted to do my research for a novel involving a narco terrorist nuclear attack on Washington, D.C. with Pentagon funding. It was the only sensible way to do it, a kind of more sense of humour. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Do you consider laughter a mystical experience? I don't know if it's mystical, but it's certainly essential. Um, it would be a very, very boring uh, book of science fiction that had, that had no humour in it, and also a very unrealistic one. We live in a very strange, surreal world these days. Um, there was a newspaper headline this morning, I don't know if you follow the British news, but um, a group of fascists held the march through London yesterday. At the same time as some counter-demonstrations by anti-fascists, and an entirely different demonstration by nature lovers campaigning against a cult of badgers, which led to the headline, Fascists chased through London by women dressed as badgers. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Well, actually, you should make this stuff up. Life would be so much more fun. And fiction is so much more fun when you have strange random moments of plausible surrealism. Because let's face it, the real world we live in is itself quite surreal. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to say that, yeah. uh, that uh, the 
possible uh, alien civilizations that we might ever uh, contact might probably not get to our attention. They wouldn't get the joke at all. Nothing. Although the dogs seem to, some apes, mm. so it crosses species lines but probably not planetary. Yeah, it may be one of these things which is wired into mammalian neural anatomy, like um, sneezing or yawning. Yawning seems to go back a very, very long way. Yawning is also socially contagious. Um, I can't do it to order, but if I were to yawn in front of the cameras and the audience, a lot of you would yawn back. Um, one of the most interesting things about yawning, incidentally, is if a cat yawns at a human being, the human will often be infected by the yawn reflex. It doesn't work the other way around. Cats are aliens. The cat, the cat doesn't consider you its master. Well, no. But, uh, if you show your fang dominance, it, it's, it, it's not just not impressed. Actually, one of the causes of laughter, well, humor, <clears throat> one particular strain of humor, quite a powerful one, emerges from cognitive dissonance through the juxtaposition of um, inexplicably or unrelated phenomena. And I think that's what I'm getting at with the humor in my fiction. And I'm always trying to look for the second order consequences of some new ideas, new technologies, new behavior, new, new human activities. Um, because let's face it, new technologies are human developed activities. Um, I'm looking at this as sort of extended human behavior, what Richard Dawkins calls the extended phenotype. The extended phenotype, the phenotype of an organism is its physical structure. The extended phenotype is what it does around it. For example, a bird's nest is part of the bird's phenotype. It's dictated by its genes, but it's not part of the bird's body. Um, we, have, we humans have a very broad extended phenotype. This entire city is part of it. The television camera through which many of you outside are watching is part of our extended phenotype. And Humor is a useful way of probing how we respond to changes in this technosphere around us, um, to changes in our interactions. A few weeks ago, the UN advised us all to start uh, mini farming, making use of insect proteins, like uh, basically growing and eating bugs. What other developments do you foresee regarding global food security? Oh, um, okay, going off the tangent again, in the near future, we have had very blood chilling warnings in the past few years over catastrophic climate change on a global scale, over extreme water shortages as more and more people live in areas that are heat stressed or lack fresh water. Um, we are already, there are so many human beings that if our agricultural productivity was at the level of 1960, billions of us would be starving. We are only alive today and relatively comfortable, and indeed fewer of us living in poverty than two decades ago on a global scale, because of the Green Revolution, a breakthrough in agronomics that involved breeding crops for far more efficiently using the resources available to them. Now, this all ties back in with the population dynamics of the human species. We are clear that there are more of us than we have ever lived before, and our numbers are still rising. But I'm an optimist on that front. It appears that the rate of increase in the human population globally is dropping very rapidly. And indeed, at the end of this century, there may be no more of us around than there are today. Um, it is going to be an uncomfortable time, to be sure. But while we may be overrunning this planet's carrying capacity, we should be able to get back to within it within a century or so. And as long as we're reasonably prudent in what we eat in our environmental footprint, we should be able to do so without any mass famines, starvation, and death. Now, one of the key things you mentioned is eating insects. I, there are many cultures where certain insects are considered a delicacy, and indeed you could argue that prawns are giant sea invertebrates, um, insects by any other name, yet many of us eat prawns or lobsters. Um, I'm inclined to think the big breakthrough 
that we're heading for is printable meat tissue culture. There's an awful lot of money currently going into research on stem cells um, because for many disease conditions where we might be able to regenerate tissue or repair human bodies and malfunctioned. Um, for example, growing heart tissue after, after a heart attack or to replace an amputated limb. The same techniques that are used to grow artificial organs in situ could in principle be used to grow much more tissue in bulk, um, hopefully to food grade. And an interesting implication of this is a cow or a pig or a chicken is a very inefficient way of converting sunlight and carbon dioxide and water from fine plants into protein that human beings can eat. Some suggestions are that that growth could be as much as 90% more energy efficient than eating farmed animals, even leaving aside the humanitarian issue of well, do you really want to kill another animal in order to eat it? Um, if you could just grow the steak without the cow attached, um, wouldn't that be better? So I suspect that's where things are going to go in the not too distant future. Um, printing, 3D printing. Civilians seem to find more preposterous uses for technologies like 3D fabricators, drones and robotics by day. Uh, will nanotechnologies or quantum computing soon be added to the list? I'm not sure. Um, 3D printers, again, machines for making things. Remember the headlines a couple of weeks ago when we used the first 3D printed handgun? Got there in fiction. Um, again, my novel, Rule 34 from 2010, has a back screen petty criminal who is printing a couple of handguns for gangster who wants to shoot somebody deniably. And his 3D printer is accidentally left online overnight um, and is the victim of some malware. So he opens it up the next morning and instead of deniable back screen handguns, he finds sex toys with a URL printed on the side. You can go to this URL and pay us 50 euros to deactivate the malware so you can print what you want to print again. Um, there are going to be many, many weirder things coming out of 3D printers than I can imagine. Um, I'm not sure it's going to upend manufacturing on a mass scale. There will always be economies of scale that a true factory can achieve, but a single one-off printer can't. But it will certainly make it easier for customised products. Now, nanotechnology is a difficult topic because it's been overhyped drastically. But at the very minimum, most of the concepts in nanotechnology can be traced back to serious, mature, genetically modified bacterial processes. <clears throat> um, we have an existence proof for a self-replicating nanomachine factory that can produce all its own components. It's called E. coli, and you're carrying billions of them around in your intestines. But they can't program them yet. Um, it's surprisingly programmable if what you want to produce is a regular protein or something like diesel oil. Um, this is actually happening today. What we would like, though, is out of mature nanotechnology, is something that bears the same relationship to E. coli that a Boeing 747 bears with paper dart. Um, we will get there eventually, but not for quite a long time, is my thinking. And I suspect that it is not going to be something you do in your home for a very long time indeed, any more than you have people building some chips in their home. You could, in principle, build your own integrated circuit um, using readily available equipment, but the price of entry and the barrier of entry is quite high. And you wouldn't be able to get many transistors on a chip that you could build in your own kitchen. It's much cheaper just to buy one from a factory. I think the same goes with nanotechnology. Um, maybe a few tips for aspiring writers. I see a few of them in the audience. Methods that you have found useful in your job as a writer. Oh, um, I could go on about this for hours on end, but I think the first rule of all is if you start something, try and finish it. And once you've tried to finish it, don't just let it sit around. Try and see if somebody will publish it, and if not, keep trying. Um, 
learn to listen to read the feedback. Um, if everybody is telling you something is no good, then they are probably right. Um, if a few people are telling you it's no good, a lot of people like it. Ask who, ask who they are. If the people you've shown your work to like it, or your family and friends, then they're probably in line to save your skin, you know, so as not to offend you. Um, if it's strangers who like it, then that's a very good sign indeed. Um, above and beyond that, though, just persist. It takes a very long time to get anywhere. It takes a long time to learn how to write. It takes an even longer time to learn, if you're writing science fiction, how to evaluate the potential of ideas, how to slot them together, how to tell a compellingly interesting story about human beings that takes stuff into account. Um, I'm not sure there are actually any general stories I can, any general advice I can give about writing other than just keep trying. I think that's good enough. Um, does anybody have any questions? Hands up. I, uh, you were first, I think. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, two questions. Uh, one of them, uh, first of all, is uh, for someone who hasn't read any of your work, uh, what do you recommend would be uh, the best uh, book to start with? Uh, and the second one is, uh, I read somewhere that uh, the your series, uh, one of them was uh, also, uh, among others, uh, inspired by Roger, Roger Zelazny, who is one of my favorite authors and uh, seems to me at least quite uh, different uh, from your style, which I'm not that familiar with, but it, it seems to me. And uh, so could you tell me a little bit um, uh, what uh, inspired, uh, uh, you know, what uh, in his work inspired your, your work and uh, uh, what uh, books of his, uh, what did you find in them? Okay, um, <clears throat> which of my books should you start with is a really difficult question because I get bored really, really easily, so I write lots of different types of science fiction. Science fiction is about 16 micro-genres flying in loose formation, and I dabble in several of them, um, ranging from <coughs> near-future police procedurals to bureaucratic comedy horror spy thrillers in a Lovecraftian universe to space opera to, well, the books you mentioned, if you're a fan of Rogers and Lansby, um, if it's his literary style that you're a fan of, I'm sorry, I'm not Rogers and Lansby. Um, he was one of the great stylists of the SF field and beyond compare, and I am not. I think I'm more workmanlike than spectacular in that regard. Um, the series of books in question, the Merchant Princess series, um, riff off the core idea in his Amber series, um, Aristocrats of the Walk Between Worlds. That is very much a fantasy series. What I did was I decided to sort of strip it very much back to basics, to minimize their ability, to humanize them, um, and to see what some of the implications were if you took the ideas seriously and tried to understand its significance and what would emerge from a group of people who can transport themselves from one timeline to another. Um, I should add, these books have recently, as in, in the past couple of months, been reissued in omnibus form in the United Kingdom and are available as e-books around Europe as well. The first one, if you want to try it, is called The Bloodline Feud. And I believe there's comments for sale out there as well. Yes, the Merchant Princess series is being translated into Estonian as well. And also Acceleronda is something that is, is already in Estonian, which I would very heartily recommend. You had a question? Someone, someone had a question. I would like to ask about uh, because science fiction is quite affected by society. In the last year, we had many uh, uh, 
many demonstrations about uh, internet freedom. So my question is, should internet remain this wild west that it is today, or should uh, government start to take some action within the internet realm? Thank you. Uh, yes and no. On the one hand, I think freedom of speech is very, very important. Um, it was thanks to the internet, for example, that the news of what is happening in Istanbul this week has got out. Um, for the most part, traditional journalists were kept well away from the demonstrations and police brutality for the first couple of days. The major media were covering the story shamefully badly, yet word got out via Twitter and Facebook, completing photographs of a large part of the city on fire um, in what people are beginning to call the Turkish Spring. This is just one example of the way that the internet contributes to a vibrant public culture of cultural literacy and of information. <clears throat> However, the internet is also very effective as a vehicle for organized criminals. Um, it has become more and more the case that, for example, spammers, people who deliver bulk unsolicited email, are using computers which have been hijacked by malware. And a lot of this is actually run by mafia. Um, so, what I'd like to see is more of a focus on preventing active crime, but less emphasis on censorship. Unfortunately, we seem to be getting the other way around. Governments are very worried about control of information, but not able to do much about criminals who loot 50 euros for bank accounts of a million people simultaneously in different countries because no one of those clients is worth more than 50 euros. So why investigate it? It's a paradox. Are there any more questions? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, a couple of questions. The first, really short. Uh, so, one, do you feel morally guilty when you eat lobster these days? I don't like lobster anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the other one is, uh, you mentioned that it would be uh, uneconomical, it would make uh, no real sense, it would be extremely difficult to terraform Mars or to uh, settle other planets, but in the 60s there was no good economical reason for uh, human beings to go to the moon, but we were just very motivated. And uh, these days, uh, there's a project going on right now of the Square Kilometer Array, which is something that's, that uh, has no practical use. And when asked, uh, why are you spending all this money and effort on it, the people who are making it are just saying, we'll probably come up with something while we're doing it. We don't know what it is, but it'll probably be as awesome uh, as the internet. Well, one can't discount the importance of religious, religion as a motivation for building cathedrals and take to and to complete. And um, at risk of, destroy, of soaring off the branch where I'm sitting on, my next novel that comes out in a month's time, Neptune's Brood, what started out as a thought experiment in, could I dream up an economic system that would provide a profit motive for interstellar colonization in a swerve and light universe with no magic interstellar faster than light starships, in fact with nothing much beyond what we've got today. Um, and I think I succeeded. I even came up with some of the criminal frauds that this system would facilitate. And uh, Paul Krogman seems to like it, so um, I'll leave you with that recommendation. Well, do you have any idols from previous generation? I think science fiction authors. I'm sorry? Idols from the previous genera gen generation of. Well, I pretty much consider Bruce Sterling to be an object of emulation. I gather he was here in town a couple of weeks ago. He was in Tartu. Ah, okay. Bruce Sterling is always 20 years ahead of everybody else in the field for some reason. He's so far ahead of the pack that he doesn't actually make a lot of money in it because nobody understands what he's doing. <laughs> he single-handedly invented the new space opera in the mid-1980s, then walked away from it after one novel and a bunch of short stories, leaving everybody else to uh, turn it into a thriving new subgenre. In, I think, 1996, he published a novel titled Heavy Weather about global climate change and giant tornadoes hitting Oklahoma City, and I um, haven't heard that anywhere recently, have we? Um, 
So yeah, he's definitely an object of emulation in the ideas department because he's always one jump ahead of everybody else at trying to work out what the implications are for how it's going to be in the next generation. Um, but maybe going further back. Further back. Um, well, that gets hard. Um, Lovecraft. Oh, well, no, I'm not actually a big fan of H.P. Lovecraft. I'm a fan of H.P. Lovecraft's ideas and his sensibility about the place of humanity in the cosmos, but his writing style gives me hives. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, the trouble is, though, trying to identify individual writers' as influences gets very, very difficult because I'm sort of immersed in a muddy soup room. Um, I stand on the shoulders of giants, actually I stand on the shoulder of millipedes, thousands of length of shoulders. Any more questions? I have a second one also. Do you get any ideas from future, future logic, Toffler and Kurzweil? Sorry? Do you get any ideas from future logics, Toffler? Futurists. Futurists. Um, yes, but futurists are very often trying to do the same thing that I'm trying to do. Um, in mundane science fiction, when I'm trying to stick rigorously to what we know about the universe around us, then yes, I'm to some extent playing on the same rule as the futurists. Um, if, on the other hand, I'm having fun writing an entertainment and playing with dragons and fast and light starships, then futurology isn't really a very useful yardstick because those guys aren't allowed to use those toys. So it really depends what I'm trying to achieve. Um, Graham Greene was of the opinion that he wrote two kinds of books. He wrote novels, which were serious, taught us something about the human soul. And he wrote entertainments, which were there to entertain. And some novels were both a novel and an entertainment in Scotland. Others were just fun or serious. And, um, I like to think of what I do is say, I have the same thing. Sometimes I'm just having fun. Um, I have a novel coming out next year about vampires, or perhaps more accurately about vampire fiction. Um, and sometimes I'm trying to do something serious, such as an examination of the future of criminology in the networked world, such as Rule 34. Um, Rule 34 played by the futurologists. And yes, I was reading some analyses of where the future of what they thought the near future would look like. Um, vampires, not so much. 